weekly, every quarter, because we see this as an extension of our chart to promote freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you agree with every single thing you hear in these conversations or read in a book on our shelves or in, in an article in one of our databases, we want you to have access so that you can learn and um, learn from a wide range of viewpoints. So we ask that everyone have a lively discussion today, but that we remain respectful of both our speaker and ourselves and each other. So we especially enjoy having students like we have today, but we have faculty members, staff, community members come in and lead these sessions. So if you are passionate about a topic, come talk to me or to Kelly in the beautiful green sweater <laughs> about hosting uh, one of these sessions. So we have a number of resources up here that are available for checkout. And if you'd like to learn more about this topic or any other topic, um, you can come talk to me or anyone else at the big desk in the middle of the library, that's the reference desk. At the end of the discussion, I'm going to ask you to fill out a brief survey so that we can learn more about what you did like, what you didn't like, how we can adapt to keep this a useful and um, interesting experience for all the Seattle Central College community members. So today, please join me in welcoming Jamil Bowling, a Seattle Central College student who will lead us in a discussion entitled Homonormativity, How a Singular Representation Damages Growth of the Queer Community. Jamil. Um, thank you guys for all joining me. Um, so to begin, I'd like to ask all of you and joining me um, in taking a few deep breaths. Um, so everyone inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. The reason why I wanted to start off that way is because I'm incredibly nervous. <laughs> I have that, um, you know that feeling when your heart feels like it's trying to like get out of your throat? I'm definitely feeling that right now. And taking deep breaths definitely helps to alleviate that. Um, the other reason is because I wanted to get a kind of a communal energy going in the room because we're going to talk about some fairly different things. Um, to begin, my name is Jamil. I use he, him pronouns, and I identify as a queer man of color. Um, it's important to talk about our, the intersectional identities that we live in because oftentimes we are presented with a singular representation in our media. Um, the singular representation erases the fact that all of our identities intersect to shape the way that we interact with our world. Um, some of my history, I come from a single mother who, was who had me when she was 17. My mother's identity was greatly affected by the fact that she grew up in a time period when her beauty and her black beauty and her features were not presented as an ideal way to look. Um, she had to strive very, very hard to validate herself and validate her appearance. And the standard of beauty that was set in no way correlated to the way she appeared. As a child, I was so ignorant to this fact. I was so ignorant to the struggle she went through. And it was very, it's very interesting because she often tried very, very hard to be like, black is beautiful, and to tell me that I was beautiful, and to tell me that I lived in a realm where I could be beautiful, and I could be valid, and I often ignored this. Um, and it wasn't until I started to enter into the dating world that I started to realize that this was something that was going to affect me, and this was something that needed to be important to me, and this was something I needed to understand. Um, and so I really regret it, and I really want to thank my mother for that. Um, I know there are some other things that we need to talk about, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that in itself is an incredibly important gift. <laughs> um, it's an important gift she gave me. Um, so, so, the topic that we're going to talk about today is homonormativity. Um, before we talk about homonormativity, um, I just want to address that the reason that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is intersectionality and how homonormativity appears in the media. The media is incredibly important to me because I grew up in a situation, I, I grew up in a very um, isolated situation in which the media was my window into the world and in window in, the window into how I could interact with the world and how I was going to react to the world. Um, when you grow up in a small environment and you only have your mother there, there's only so much my mother could give me. There's only so much empowerment that my mother could give me. And I needed to find validation outside of my mother. That is not to say that media is the only way in which to validate yourself, but it is an important tool that we often present to children as a way of validating themselves, as a way of finding role models, and as a way of finding people that look like them and relate to them in the stories that need, that need to be told. Um, and so for me, 
I often looked to the media and I looked for stories, I looked for experiences that could relate to mine, and I looked for intersectional experiences, and those were not presented to me at my age. And I would say that those are not, um, that there's still, there is still a need even today. Um, so, before we really jump in, I want to define a few terms. Um, I'm going to start by defining privilege. Um, privilege is a term that most of you have probably heard before, and it really speaks to the institutionalized power and empowerment that is given to some over others. If we're speaking really clearly, it's often given basically hierarchically to cis white men, and then everyone kind of falls down below that. And um, this privilege is incredibly damaging because it, it takes away the power, it takes away the humanity, and it takes away the ability to live our truths for many people who are the marginalized, and many people are fallen to the minority um, culture. Um, the other term that we're going to define is oppression. Oppression is also institutionalized. It's also a way of pushing down those who do not fall into the norm, who do not fall into the standard, who do not fall into what is accepted as the right way to live your life, um, or the right way to live your experience. Um, next term is patriarchy. Um, this term is incredibly important to me. I identify first and foremost as a feminist. I try not to say that too often because I don't want to take away the value of, uh, I don't want to um, speak too much for being a male feminist and, take, and make that message all about me, but at the same time it is something that was incredibly important to me. And if I hadn't identified as a feminist, I wouldn't have um, identified as someone who supported people of color and who had supported career rights. It definitely was a stepping stone from identifying as a feminist and realizing the intersectionality between how, how that affects queer issues and how it affects people of color for me to even get to that stepping stone and for me to feel empowered myself. Um, patriarchy in itself speaks to the empowerment of men over women um, and that we live in a system that continuously empowers men over women. Um, the next term is people of color. This is pretty obvious and pretty clear to most people. It essentially speaks to anyone who is perceived as a racial minority and anyone who is perceived and treated as something lesser or something other than what is set as the standard. Um, okay, next term is queer. Queer is a term that has been re-empowered and has, be, has been reclaimed. And it is an umbrella term to capture all that fall into what is not the gender or sexual norms of our society. Um, queer was once a term that was used as a derogatory way of attacking people who didn't fit into that, that sexual standard or that gender standard. And it is now a word that we have claimed for ourselves and that we claim and that we use to present ourselves and to um, create a culture of unity between those minorities. Um, the next term, and this one's important to me, and I've, I've had to find a way to very simply and very eloquently describe it to people because I often use it and I don't realize that some people don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, so the term trans or transgender refers to anyone whose gender identity does not correlate to the gender identity that was placed on them at birth. The word cis or cisgender correlates to anyone whose gender identity does match that that was placed on them at birth. Um, I'm defining all these terms because I'm going to be using a lot of them throughout my speech and I want you guys all to have a similar, or to at least understand my working definition of these terms. Okay, jumping right in. Heteronormativity. There's no way to talk about homonormativity without talking about heteronormativity. Heteronorm heteronorm heteronormativity um, <laughs> speaks on anything that sets a binary hetero heterosexual standard as a way to live your life and as a goal for how to live your life. Um, and, it gives, and it gives privilege to those who do fit into that heteronormative standard. Um, homonormativity, there's many layers to homonormativity. The first is it sets that being gay and a cis gay male as the standard for the proper way to be queer in our society, and as the only way, the only accepted way to be queer in our society. And any who don't fall into that and who don't match that are not living the proper way to be queer in our society. Um, and so, oh, the other part of homonormativity, the other layer of homonormativity, is that, um, is that there's this idea that the goals and the ideals and the representations and the passions of cis gay men should be the goals and the ideals and the representations of all queer, all in the queer community. And, and it, and the big problem with that is it sets this idea that 
um, and it sets this idea that by representing those goals, we are representing the goals of the entire career community, which is just not true, and we are not representing everyone's experiences. Um, I just want to take a moment to clarify that I really, really have a hard time with technology, which is why I chose not to do a PowerPoint. I actually made an entire PowerPoint. It was beautiful. I'm an artist. It was great. But just the idea, I feel like sometimes people use PowerPoints and they just put like block text and they expect you to like read that and then they're reading it and you're all reading it and that's just not the way to go. So I went old school and I made note cards. But I also didn't want to be lame and like flipping through my note cards and like throwing them on the floor. So I'm like laying them out. So I mean, I essentially made up like a like technology fully list like PowerPoint. So I don't know. But I'm hoping that I'm doing a decent enough job with my words of painting a picture that you don't also need the images up on the board. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I also want to clarify that there will be time at the end to ask questions, and I really, really, really encourage you to ask ask questions because I personally am a person who does much better at um, conversation than I do at actual like presentation. So really, really, I encourage you to ask me all these questions. I love it. Um, so yeah, take a moment. Um, so the media, if we can all agree that the media is an incredibly important tool to empower people, and it is also a tool that is often used to disempower people. It is often taken as a way to take um, agency away from people, people of color, trans women, trans women of color. Um, if we can agree to that, then we must agree that, there, that we need to take agency and we need to take responsibility over what is being presented to us in the media and what we're allowing to be presented to us in the media. Um, the media has the power to modify the cultural beliefs that are held in our society. It has the power to, um, it has the power to change the way in which we view our world and change the way in which we interact with our world. In Glad's recent in Glad's recent report of queer representation, they said that 65% of the queer representation in um, TV and film were gay men. They have also reported that 30% were bisexual and that 10% were gay women. Um, the representation of trans people were so poor that a percentage is not even given. Um, I want to address quickly that um, there is an incredible amount of bisexual erasure in the media. Um, and so what people often categorize as um, bisexual representation is simply the idea that someone suggests that they might have bisexual tendencies, but there is something to be said for someone who, for a character who goes through that, and then a character who actually claims bisexual as their identity. And that bisexual claiming is something that is <laughs> oh, like it's never done, basically, and it's in, and it's incredibly disempowering, and it's a, and, it, and there's nothing wrong with someone questioning their identity and not labeling themselves, but there is something wrong with saying that there are thirty or so characters who are bisexual, but none of them actually claim it, and none of them actually feel empowered in that identity. Um, so, <laughs> um, shows that are famous for having queer representation are. Um, Will and Grace, um, um, Glee, um, good one, but not, I wouldn't say notorious, Sex in the City, and um, The New Normal. Um, if you look at the shows that I listed, the representations in those shows are all cis, white, identified gay people. Um, and these are shows that have played such an important role. Sex in the City, come on now. Mm -hmm. Like these are shows that have played a, such an important role in shaping our society. All of us have either heard of them, seen them, know the names of the characters, have related to them, and in some way embraced them into our homes, into this window that I painted, that the media shows into us. Um, but these representations only paint one image, and only paint one experience, and only paint, only paint one picture. The really, really important the really, really important topic, the really, really important part of homonormativity is that there's two layers to it. There's, there's the layer of how we, as queer identified people, might perceive ourselves through watching it and watching this poor representation in the media, and there's the layer in which others who might not necessarily be queer identified learn to perceive us through watching these um, characters on television. Um, <clears throat> this, this capturing of only one story does an amazing job, and by amazing, I mean disgusting job, at erasing transgender people from television 
of erasing pe queer people of color, of erasing queer women, and of erasing other queer minorities from the dialogue and from, from the media. Um, and these are the stories that really need to be told. And these are the people who are incredibly marginalized. And these are the people who have suffered so much in our society and aren't often talked about and aren't getting the exposure that they need and are being on a regular systematic basis dehumanized and are not given agency. And this dehumanization is really, really the core of this topic and it's really, really the part that is often not talked about and it's really the part that becomes incredibly dangerous when we talk about the real world, quote unquote. Um, there are some representations of queer minorities in the media um, but they aren't often multifaceted. They are often one-dimensional, and they are often used as plot devices. Um, from the very beginning of time, when we all watched Lion King, and they said, dress and drag and do the hula, and there was that brief clip, and it was used as a comedic device, um, till moments, till the, till the character in Will and Grace. Um, Will and Grace is a show about <clears throat> a cis gay white middle class man in his cis gay or in his cis straight um, female roommate, um, they have two other friends, and one of those friends is a character named Jack. The character that you're supposed to empathize with, the character, the the title character, Will, is presented as a masculine in, man, and he is given human agency, and he is someone who you're supposed to relate to, and someone who you're supposed to um, that you're supposed to embrace into your home. But his counterpart, Jack is presented as a feminine gay man. And to be feminine, as in our society, because we live in a patriarchal society, to be feminine is the lesser. And our society has told us this over and over and over again. And it is often exaggerated most within communities of color and often within queer communities. And which is so sad to think about because if you think about homophobia in its essence, it really is a direct offshoot of misogyny. And so this, embra this embracing of feminine to be the lesser, and the character Jack being considered the lesser, and the character Jack being used as even more of a comedic device in a show that is already a sitcom, a situational comedy, was disgusting, and very hard to witness. Um, the other important part, the other important dialogue is that um, oftentimes um, queer people of color are fetishized. A great, a great amazing example of this is Santana Lopez from the show Glee, a Latina woman, a Latina queer woman, who is often sexualized, often infantilized, often used as a sec sexual symbol. And if you think of the layers in our society, if you talk about that intersectionality, if you talk about those intersectional experiences, Latina women already face so much fetishization in our society, and already are stereotyped as being this, these sexual, hot-headed, and they're often presented as purely um, idols for white men, essentially. Um, or at least for the male gaze. Um, and then if you look at the layer of bisexual and lesbian women also being presented often as idols for the male gaze. And if you add those two layers together and then a show like Glee that is often presented on this pedestal for doing so much for the queer community, taking that and using that and embracing that in a character and giving her so little representation and so little backstory in comparison to their cis gay white characters is incredible. Um, and by incredible, I again mean disgusting. Um, um, and this is, this is an incredibly important topic to me because um, fetishization, the fetishization of women and the fetishization of women of color has become so dangerous. And it's, it's always been a dangerous topic, but it's dangerous in the sense, it's dangerous, I almost feel more so in 2015 because we are sitting here patting ourselves on the back for doing such an amazing job when the rates of sexual assault and sexual violence against women of color, against trans women of color, trans lives matter, people of color, black lives matter, for saying these things, and the rates of sexual assault are incredible. And we live in 2015 and we're patting ourselves on the back and there's so much work to be done. Um, okay, the other level, the other level of homonormativity that um, slightly uh, slightly varies from the media representation that we'll again tie back soon, um, is this idea that gay marriage is the goal of all <laughs> queer people. I'd like to start this by saying that I one day hope to get married and have a family. 
So in no way am I saying that marriage should not be anyone's goal, and in no way am I saying that marriage is wrong. But what I am saying is the singular story, this one story, this one goal being presented as everyone's goal, and as the way that everyone needs to live their life and the only correct way to live your life, that is where we find fault. You cannot suggest to everyone that there is a one singular heteronormative binary standard in which to live your life. And we cannot continue to allow these gay campaigns to represent that as our only goal. There's so many dangers. One of the big dangers is by setting that as the only goal, we are erasing the fact that there's so 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 much out there's so much other work to be done. Um, oh, one thing I want to get into before I talk about the other work that needs to be done. Um, the fault, one of the big faults with gay marriage being represented as our our standard and our goal is that marriage in our society is really really only accessible to a select few. And it makes it really, it, it makes it incredibly disempowering for someone who might not have access and might have not have the money and might have not have the economic status to really, really get married at this point in their life. To be told that the only way in which to be successful is to get married. Um, that is not to say that poor people don't get married and that's not to say that everyone's not getting married, but uh, is to say that it is much more, it's significantly more accessible to the middle class. And so to set that as a standard and as an impossible standard um, is very, very harsh. So, there, it was reported that 10% um, of youth in America identify as queer, but 40% of homeless youth in America identify as queer. Where is that distinction coming from? Where is that way that those numbers vary so far? That means that, means that 10% of the people in this room, 10% of the people that we're interacting with identify as queer, but when we're going on the streets and when we're seeing people who are asking for food and when we're seeing these children sitting on the streets and when we're seeing these people coming up with creative ways to ask us for money with cardboard signs, that 40% of them are queer. And that there's something that our society is doing, there's something that our society is not doing to support these people that is enabling this and allowing this to happen. There is a dehumanization to the point where families are kicking out these children, They're to the point where churches are not supporting these children, to the point where our institutionalized societal um, things are not benefiting these children, not benefiting these queer youth, not benefiting these queer youth of color, these homeless queer youth of color. Um, and this can be so dangerous when we look at the resources that we're placing out there, when we look at the ways that we need to interact and the ways that we need to help these people. If we're only being presented with homeless youth, what are the what are the needs and the desires and the wants of these queer homeless youth that aren't being talked about, that aren't being addressed, and that we aren't and that we aren't helping with? When we talk about when we talk about the intersectionality of being trans, um, there's a lot of medical needs that aren't being talked about with the trans community because we aren't being educated about it. These health needs are not are being addressed at a much less rate for homeless youth, but these are legitimately these are legitimate health concerns, and they aren't being discussed, and they aren't being addressed, and they aren't being assisted in this way. Um, when we talk about the when we have the conversation about homicide. The rates of the victims of homicide are reported 90% to be people of color. 90%. That's like. <laughs> I'm laughing because that's like nerve wracking to me to think that 90% of the homicide in this country that's represented as being the land of the free are people of color. And then you take that 90% and then you and then you learn that 72% are trans women, specifically trans women. What in our society is allowing that number to be so high? What in our society, what are we not doing to support trans women in our society? 90% people of color, 72% trans women. And then you add the layer of 67% of homicide is reported to be trans women of color. Again, black lives matter, trans lives matter, black trans lives matter. And we're sitting here and allowing, and we're sitting on a, we're sitting on a ratio of people. How many trans women of color do you know? And yet, greater than half are dying off in our in our society, in our in our um, 
and, and we're sitting on this number, and it's a number that is not being talked about in the media. When we talk about, I mean, when we see the coverage in the media of Baltimore, and we see the cover of Ferguson, the num we aren't discussing the ratio of black women that are dying, and we aren't discussing the, the ratio of trans black women that are dying in these situations, in these environments. These are not ratios that we're going to hear about. These are not things that we're going to discuss. And so we, as people, and as people who consume the media, have a power over that media. We are the people who are supporting them. We are the people that are paying them. We are the people that are enabling them to do what they do. And if we want to see agency, and if we want to see an empowerment of people, and if we want to end those numbers, if we want to reduce them, and if we all can agree that media, media does play an important role in the way that we interact with our world, in the way that we learn our world, in the way that we validate ourselves, then we must take responsibility and we must do something. We have, we have the power, we have the resources, we have the responsibility, so we must do something. Um, so, I wanna end on a fairly positive note um, and talk about the progress that has been made. Um, I recently had the amazing experience of seeing um, Laverne Cox at UW. It was, was anyone else there? It was like, <laughs> like I loved her before and then I like saw her and I was like in the same room and I like felt her energy and her soul and her personality and everything and I was like just crying, just like, it was amazing. Um, for those of you who do not know, Laverne Cox is um, a, a fairly featured character on the show Orange is the New Black. Raise your hand if you watch the show. Great show. Um, it's coming back June seventh, I believe. You should do a party at my house. Um, binge watch pizza. Um, and Laverne Cox and that character, the character Sophia, is an incredibly important character because it is one of the first times that a trans woman of color is featured as a main character and featured as a multifaceted character in a fairly mainstream show. Um, and telling that story and telling that experience up. Fact recently found out, and I was very curious about this. Um, the person who plays Laverne Cox's character Sophia before she transitions in the show is her twin brother. Um, <laughs> also, rumor has it I learned this at the speech. Um, her twin brother, I don't remember it exactly, and I might be misquoting. And everyone who saw this might be able to say this better than I did. But um, I just love this, and I kind of want to like I don't know, embrace it and somehow get it or something, but he, um, she asked him how he wanted to be identified when she's giving her speech, and, he's in, um, and he says, well, I don't want to be identified as gay because I feel like that's just a product of an imperialist white societal I loved it. Um, but, um, so yeah, anyways, um, the Vern Cox said some really, really incredible things. And, um, and, and she has been given such a platform, a platform that is often not given to trans women and to given to trans women of color and given to queer people of color. And then she is doing such an amazing job of using that platform. I speak very, very often about the way in which we have, our, we have, such, a, we have such a culture of celebrity worship mm -hmm. and we are not holding these celebrities to a certain standard. We are paying their bills. We are giving them this power and we are giving them this platform and they are not using this platform to defend us. And we have such a culture of celebrity worship and these celebrities are failing us very often. But there are celebrities like LeBron Cox, celebrities who for the first time, a trans woman of color was on the cover of Times Magazine. How empowering do you think that feels to walk down the street and see someone who relates to you, someone who can tell your story, be on the cover of Time Magazine? Um, how empowering do you think it feels to see someone who is telling a story that relates to yours on a show that everyone is watching, that everyone is talking about? Hashtag Orange is the New Black. And you see a character that relates to you. Um, and she is using that platform, and she is going to schools, and she is giving academic talks, and she is telling people, she is telling people her story. She is forcing people to relate to her. She is forcing people to see her as a human being. She is taking away the fact that media is systematically dehumanizing trans women of color, and she is empowering herself and empowering others like her. That is incredible. And it is so often that we do not give agency to these role models, and we, do, we are not supporting these people who can really be seen as celebrities. And we are not giving the same amount of worship to people who are really doing something to empower people like us, and we are giving it to people who are 
making things like the Kylie Jenner challenge. Um, <laughs> um, and so I think this is incredibly important. And, and also I think it's incredibly important to realize that, to re oh, so one of the things that Laverne Cox spoke about and I think was something that I really, really related to, and, and there's so many, this talk, this talk about intersectionality, she is a queer person of color and I could really relate to her on that, on that level of being a queer person of color. But there are some things that I can't relate to but I could empathize with. Being a trans woman, I don't know what it is to experience that but she did an amazing job of helping me to empathize with that. But one thing that we can all uh, empathize with, and one thing she spoke about, she talked about that there's a difference between guilt and shame. And that for me was like the moment that I was like, okay, so we're good, this is what I came here for, I got what I needed, I can leave now, I can bag, I'm gonna go. And what she described is that guilt is what someone feels when they feel that they have done something wrong. And shame is what someone feels when they feel that they are wrong. And our society is systematically telling us, as people of color, as queer people, as queer people of color, as women, that we are wrong, and that we have something to feel shame about, and that we have something to doubt ourselves about, and it is invalidating our experiences, invalidating our voices. <laughs> it's telling us that we are too sensitive. It is telling us that we don't have, we aren't allowed to take power over our bodies. It is telling us that we only exist in a world where we are meant to only react to cis white men. We are only allowed to react to the world around us. We are not meant to interact with the world around us. And it was incredibly, it was incredibly empowering to hear that I could feel guilt for an action and I could take humility, humility in myself, but I did not have to be ashamed of myself. And for so long, living in a, living in a world where black men are um, demasculinized and taking that layer of black men being de demasculinized but then gay men don't like femininity, then taking those layers and taking that shame, and taking all those layers of shame, and they're intersectional within me, but they, that intersectionality is not represented on the media, and there's no way for me to learn that there are people who do not feel ashamed, and to hear that talk and to hear her say something that was so universal, so universal, we have all felt ashamed, and we have all felt guilt. And to learn that that is an experience that is universal, and that we do not need to feel shame for being the minority, not need to be feel, we do not need to feel ashamed for being marginalized, and that there is something that is being done wrong to us, and that we are not wrong. That was incredibly empowering. But as part, but as part of realizing that we are the victim, we need to realize also that we cannot always play the victim. That we need to empower ourselves, and that we need to use we need to use these intersectional identities. We need to use the fact that we are people of color and unite within ourselves. We need to use the fact that we are queer people. And unite ourselves. We need to use these intersectional identities and empower all the marginalized people around us because it's with all those voices, with all those empowered marginalized voices that we can fight a system. We can fight a system that oppresses us. We can fight, we can fight a system that uses the media to oppress us. We can, fight, we can fight poor representation in the news media. We can fight to learn. We want to hear. We want to hear. It matters to me. It matters to me what is happening to trans women of color in Baltimore. And we want to hear that. And with those united voices, we can fight to try to hear that. We can try to fight to learn that. Um, but it is only with that united voice. And so I talk about that because I, I, love to, I love to spread positivity and I love to spread that there is some progress being made. The fact that Laverne Cox was one of the first trans women to be um, nominated for an Emmy nomination. Incredible. I love to hear that. <laughs> Part of it is also that I want to discuss um, ways in which we as a room, ways that are accessible for us to, to, further that, to further that momentum, to keep that momentum going. Um, one important thing is to, remain, is to remain media literate. And what I mean by that is that we must take a critical mind when analyzing the media that is thrown in us. We are internalizing media on a regular basis. We have social media, we have TV, we have advertisements, we have words and signs and colors and everything everywhere, noise. And we must remain literate and we must remain knowledgeable and we must remain critical when internalizing and when learning about and when, and when interacting with the world around us. Um, and it is this world around us and it is this interaction and it is this critical nature and this critical mind that is gonna be our tool and it's gonna be our weapon to cutting down patriarchy. It's gonna be cutting down racism. 
and is the only way that we, it's the only tool that we are given, our minds are the only tool that we are given in order to fight this, in order to communicate with, their, with each other. Um, the other thing that's incredibly important is when, <laughs> is to remember that you can watch a show, you can interact with media, and you can still, um, and you can still remain critical of it. So it's not to say that you have to stop watching every show that represents misogyny in some way, but you must remain aware of that misogyny. You must remain aware that racism is happening. You must be critical of that. Um, the other important layer is that, um, <laughs> the really, really important part, for me at least, is that you must remain open-minded and you must remember to listen to others around you. You can still watch Game of Thrones, but when someone tells you that they find it incredibly misogynistic and that it's supporting um, sexual violence culture, um, you have to hear that. And that's not to say that you have to stop watching it immediately, but you have to hear that and you have to be open to that. And they're not attacking you by saying that this is offending them, they're just attacking that system and they want you to be aware, they want you to hear their story because their story is not being told anywhere else. So you have to listen to their story and you have to listen to what they're telling you. Um, is this all making sense? Am I just like saying words? <laughs> I'm <gonna> just like, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's an incredibly important topic, and I think it's something that we are often very, very unaware of, and we're very unaware. I and I, I say that because I've done it so many times. I've like loved a show. I don't know, I'm trying to think of a really good example. Hmm? Oh, I did love Will and Grace. You're right. We talked about that, didn't we? Yeah, I loved Will and Grace. And then someone was like, um, there are no Show. And like my immediate reaction was like, well, but queer representation and like there's gay people and like, but I and I tuned out, I tuned out their story and I tuned out them telling me something and then I had to realize and I had to check myself and I still watch Rolling Grace every once in a while but now I'm watching it through that filter of there is incredibly poor representation and they are demas and they are demasculinizing certain characters and they are giving certain agency to certain characters over other characters and they are making certain characters. Comedic. And so seeing it through that filter helps me to do a better job of being media literate and doing a better job of interacting with the world around me. I feel like I'm really forgetting something. I don't know what it is. So we're going to take questions, and hopefully maybe I'll remember. Um, is that good? Yeah. OK. Any questions? sense to be skeptical about, about any kind of social construction and, and, and so reasonable to be skeptical about marriage. But might it be the case that the reason that bigots are so upset about granting everyone the right to choose their own pair bonding is be precisely because pair bonding is so vitally important to human beings? Um, I have, I guess I should have done a better job of phrasing it as the sense of media representing that as the only goal versus the fact that that being an institutionalized goal. Um, what I say by that is, and I, this is something I forgot to mention, is that I feel that the media representation of gay marriage in the court case that was happening recently on gay marriage was incredibly distracting to the deaths that were happening in Baltimore at the time and of queer deaths that were happening at Baltimore at the time. So in no way am I suggesting that there is, a, there is not an importance to pair bonding but what I am suggesting is that the media representing that as such an importance is incredibly distracting to other stories. I think, it just, I don't know if that adds a good question or not. Well, but to say it's a distraction is to say that it's serving an unnecessary purpose. But no, if it's actually not, necessary, then. No, no, I'm saying that only representing that and only showing that can be a distraction. And it has a necessary oh, purpose. And that's, yeah, right. And that's why it's good to question a construction of marriage, why the construction of any of the pair bonding scheme. Why is it that scheme? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Did, 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 I feel like I'm missing your question directly then. Well, I guess I'm agreeing with you halfway. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Meet me halfway. I got you. Okay. Any other questions?
get him on your feet yourself, <laughs> whatever, you know. And so sometimes he will want to wear his sister's clothes, sometimes he'll want to wear his Spider-Man. And the first thing he says is, like, uh, we just had this conversation the other day, I want to wear this princess dress. I said, okay, then, you know, wear it. And he said, but everybody will laugh at me. That's the first thing he always says. And he's three years old, and he's so aware of how he walks through this world, and if he does this, people will treat him this way, and if he does this, people will treat him this way. And I tell him, Marcel, do you like that dress? Mm -hmm. And he says, yes. I said, do you want to wear that dress? And then he will think about it. I said, if you want to wear that dress, wear that dress. It's about what you want. And then he says, but I like the Spider-Man. I said, then wear the <laughs> Spider-Man. But I like the glitter shirt. Then wear the glitter shirt. It's not about what other people, but the thing that I'm saying is he's three. And so when I hear that 10% of youth, you know, report whatever the, you know, statistic was, I, I don't believe that. I think that that percent is greater because mm -hmm. I think that there is this fear of retaliation mm -hmm. and, you know, oppression. And I think that the um, a lot of those kids that are out on the streets, you know, a lot of times they get kicked out if their, you know, families don't accept their truth. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that has a big thing to do with the, okay. yeah. Um. I agree with you entirely. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that I didn't is that um, I think that with the growth of representation, people can potentially, someone might go and see representation and see a gay cis white man and be like, well, I don't really relate to that, but I'm feeling something, but I guess I can't relate to being queer. And so with the growth of representation, I would hope that people might start to find more people that they can relate to and more words and more labels and more tools to use to help them identify for themselves. Um, and then one thing is I want to thank you for that because I think if, if my mother had done a better job of what you're doing and if the society had done a better job of doing what you're doing, I think I would have avoided so much heartache and so much mm -hmm. pain because for me, what I needed to be told so often is not that I am beautiful for being black, but that I am just an empowered and beautiful person mm -hmm. just in my own realm. And so then I could take, when someone was telling me that I'm not beautiful for being black, I could know within myself that I am an empowered, beautiful person, and then I could combat that. And I think you're doing an excellent job of that with your son because you're giving him the tools to find validation within himself without telling him that he needs to find validation for this thing and for this thing. He needs, he, you're not telling him he needs to find validation in his masculinity. You're telling him that he is a valid person in himself and he is a human being. And society is doing such an incredible job of not telling him that. And I think that's so incredible. Like, Sorry. <laughs> it's yeah. Well, and that it is true. That's the last thing I said. Mm -hmm. But I mean, other parents they question me, and they're like, "What are you doing to your kid? Why are you going to the zoo?" And he wore his entire outfit it was leopard and cheetah and bright pink and glitter dress, and he looked beautiful. Mm -hmm. But and you know, people said, "Let her come through," and he was still Marcel. Mm -hmm. That was still Marcel. It, it didn't matter, you know, what he was and. So many people got mad. Like mm. Parents got mad mm. at me. Why would you let your son do that? Why would you do that to him? Mm. What do you think? What is the, what is your point? And then I said I didn't have a point. That's what he wanted to wear. So I let him wear it. And I'm not gonna lie. Like it was very hard for me and different. And you know when people said let let her come through, I wanted to be like no no. And then I had to catch myself mm. like let him be. And if he didn't care, then why should I care? You know and and. That's a very hard thing with being a parent. Is like it's not about us; it's about our kids. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with our mm -hmm. society, that's what we don't get. It's mm -hmm. not about what we want for this person. Mm -hmm. It's about what that person mm -hmm. wants. Mm -hmm. um, to speak on that one point is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> speak on that, it's very, very hard sometimes for parents, I feel, and I've talked about this before, um, about for parents to separate their identity from their child's identity, because their identity is that of a parent. At some point, your identity does become that of a parent, and at some point, you identify yourself as, I'm a mother to a son, or I'm a mother to this child, and, and when their identity conflicts with how you paint them, it's often hard on yourself, and it's often a lot of work, and in no way do I want to invalidate that experience of a parent, because that is hard, that is in hard crap, challenging your own identity is hard, but it is not, but that that hard, that, that level of pain is not enough to distract you from doing what you need to do for your child, and so I think.
realize that. That's a genuine. <laughs> um, you had a question. Um, just just a, a comment. Uh, I'm Ariana, I'm the, the trio director here. I've actually been at Seattle Central for 10 months now, and this is the first like large conversation um, that I've had about um, really like peeling back the layers of the onion and getting to the root cause of why so many students here um, don't always feel like they belong. Um, and I was one of those students about 10 years ago when I was in my community college experience. So I just wanted to say thank you um, for having this space. And um, I am um, lending my support um, in, in you know increasing the conversation. Because I've worked with a lot of students here um, who are struggling with their identity, who really are struggling to fit in and really feel validated. And I feel like that's not only my responsibility, but that's our entire community. I actually just recently um, got back from a, a small trip to Puerto Rico with my wife where um, the 2020 um, Bruce Jenner interview was happening. It was fascinating to see all these people watching this show, right? And I was, I was hesitant about watching it, but I would love your thoughts on that. If you watched it, like what your thoughts were because you, you bring up a great point about like having a critical eye, right? And there were so many instances where I felt like this is great hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I agree. And so I'm going to start off by saying that um, there is no, there is no way to invalidate the value of having just trans, the word trans, and the word of someone identifying as a woman just out in the media. Mm -hmm. That is something that just needs to happen more often. There's no way to invalidate that. Um, there were some problems. Um, I do not identify as a trans person, so I, I, I would be more curious to hear how, what a trans person felt. But one thing I can talk about is um, the way in which reporters um, discuss trans issues has been incredibly poor in our, in our society. In fact, a really a decent example that I don't want to distract from the Bruce Jenner situation, but um, Miley Cyrus recently um, came out as um, potentially genderqueer. I don't know, I, I need to do more research on this, I literally was reading it on the bus here. But the, the article I read said that she, she what did it, it said like she identified as gay, or like that she identified as homosexual now, and they do, the articles do, and like media and um, news sources do such a poor job of understanding that there's a significant difference between gender and sexuality. And so to report the headline, the entire article, under something related to her sexuality, mm -hmm. and to not to preface it and just talk about how it's really a relation of her gender is incredibly poor. So. Yeah. yeah, and then they're like, well, she's gay now. And I'm like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, and oh, talking about celebrity worship though, Miley Cyrus, as much as problems that you might have with her, does it, did, has done a really amazing thing. She is addressing the homelessness of queer youth on the streets. I mean, like, Thank you, Miley Cyrus. But do you want to say something? Well, I had another comment. It was it is it connected to this or no? It's actually connected to the Miley. Okay, let's. Okay, go ahead. Say it. No, I'll I'll connect it. Oh, well, I'll I was just like, curious because <laughs> we seem to be talking a lot about like media representation and how, <clears throat> like, in in order to combat the state of representation, that using media to show diversity is one method, mm -hmm. um, which I think is great. And I remember at the Laverne Cox event that she had said at the end that people now have the agency, like she's giving advice mm -hmm. for people who want to be actors, mm -hmm. um, and that we have the agency and ability to create our own media mm -hmm. now. And so I guess my, my question is like, a lot of people do create their own media, but um, getting it like networking mm -hmm. between other people and then getting it somehow exposed to the mainstream, because the mainstream sometimes will pick it up. And uh, the connection for me was I read this Miley Cyrus article this morning as well, and watched the video of her and Joan Jett singing a mm -hmm. song. Um, and I realized that in the article, they make a reference to Angel Hayes, who mm -hmm. is another mm -hmm. queer and black artist who does very specifically identify as very queer mm -hmm. and uses they them pronouns. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting because a lot of people had invalidated that in other mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. But then once a famous white mm -hmm. person like Miley comes out, then they reference Angel Hayes. So in some ways, it's kind of bad, but then also, hey, anybody reading this article yeah. might look up yeah. Angel Hayes' music now. Um. I really want to get back to what you were saying because I want to connect it, but one thing I want to say to address this is that there's been a lot of challenges to Macklemore for talk, doing a song and getting popular for doing a song about gay culture and about queer culture and then also being a white guy in hip-hop. 
Um, and, um, layers. And, and layers and layers. And I, and I, um, and I, I do think there is some. Ch I do think there is some challenges to that. I do think there is some repercussions to that. I do not necessarily blame him, though. I do think that's an institutionalized pl the platform that he has been put on just by her. Um, but what I do think is that he needed to use that platform at that point to empower people like Angel Hayes and to empower other queer black artists and to empower those people that he is singing about and talking about and he's going to be a champion for, he needs to do a better job of empowering those people. So I do agree that there is a layer um, in which people need to start to use their own, ah, oh, that's the thing I forgot, thank you. <laughs> There is privilege given to all of us. And the reason why I'm giving this speech is because I am a cis man, essentially. Um, and, there, and I feel empowered in being a cis man. And so I use, I'm using my voice, and I'm trying to use my voice and my privilege to speak for other people and to speak for the people who are even more particularly marginalized than I am. And so I would encourage people to challenge their celebrities and to challenge their celebrity worship and to challenge people on their platforms to do similar things and to use their platform as something. I would challenge people to look at themselves and to analyze their own privilege and to use that privilege to empower other people. That is one big point that I wanted to make. I probably forgot. So thank you for reminding me of that. Um, and then your point about um, the Bruce Jenner situation. I think that one flaw that I've seen is that the way in which um, gender and gender identity and gender labels and pronouns were used was interesting. And the reason why I say it was interesting is because I've heard people refer to Bruce afterwards in so many different ways. And I think that's, and I don't know how I want to re refer to Bruce either. Um, I think what I remember is that he has said that he identifies as a woman, that he is gonna continue to use he, him pronouns for a time being. And I feel like I've seen people kind of take that and use it and analyze it themselves. And I think there's the important la level of, la the important level of layers, I mean of labels, is that you must respect how someone wishes to be labeled. At the end of the day, no matter what, no matter what you agree with, no matter what you disagree with, no matter what, you must respect someone in the way they wish to be labeled, in the way they wish to be identified. And that's why I began my entire speech with telling you my pronouns and telling you how I identify, so that you can all respect that, and I'm giving you that opportunity to respect that. Does that kind of touch on? Yeah. Okay. You're doing great. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Did you, do you want to say something? Are you just touching your ear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of starting with a comment, but, um, particularly getting into things like will and grace and singular representation, a lot of what I've found I need to be critical of in media is seeing one representative character, mm -hmm. like you know, the, the, the four white guys and mm -hmm. their, their female friends mm -hmm. kind of set up for, you know, four white guys and their, their gay friend. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's only one person to represent this entire community. Mm -hmm. And how is it being represented? How does that change when you have, you have like Jack Mm -hmm. Now he's the bad gay, mm -hmm. and Will is mm -hmm. the good gay, and and you're still pitting people against mm -hmm. each other. You're not providing good representation, mm -hmm. getting more representative bodies in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, seeing seeing media where, like, say say passing the Bechdel test, if you're familiar with it, like two women who actually speak to each other about not being a male character. Mm -hmm. you know, seeing that transform into something that works for other communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we do we see two gay people doing something other than, than my entire character is gay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that the content? So to speak on the Vecto test, the Vecto test, which you referenced, is um, when two female characters in a film or a show uh, have a conversation with each other about a topic that is not a man, which is. <laughs> If you really use that and analyze that and look at shows, that is the part of being media literate. It is not a thing that happens, <laughs> especially which is which is incredible for me and painful for me, especially within children shows. That is in children television and children movies. It's you know, far worse within children media, which is incredible. Um, so I agree, setting some sort of standard, some sort of some sort of media literacy that would address that within queer yeah. communities and people of color. But also watching out for it and and, and asking for, for not just better representation but more representation yeah. within single worlds or yeah. single mm -hmm. single Universe. pieces of media. Yeah. Um, I said I saw you and then I saw you. So yeah. So I um, Tom Beto, I, I'm teaching the LGBTQ class, lots of my students here, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Um, so a couple of things. One is I, I think we know enough about um, the the queer community and the movements and the social movements that we've you know that, that have come about and have created change, 
and so I, I just want to warn us to, to think beyond the, sort of the, the media, currently particularly we, in the context of late capitalism, right, the media belongs to very few people. Mm -hmm. And they're going to represent what they need to represent for their own interests. And so, again, coming back to your point about creating our own media, right, mm -hmm. so most of the change that we've seen is not about media representation. In other words, for us to ask the master to, hey, can you represent us better? This doesn't work, right? We need to represent ourselves. We need to make create more representations of ourselves within our communities themselves. So the, the work really is local rather than and yeah, I mean I'm you know I, I look at the media as sort of this this place where I can sort of see what the mainstream is trying to do with, with us, mm -hmm. not for us, with mm -hmm. us, right? Mm -hmm. And they churn us up and they make us into these caricatures at times and um, so that's that's the one thing it's just sort of like what we know is that the change actually happens within us and among us in our mm -hmm. communities and that's the work that needs to happen and so you know make films make media make our own media that's uh, that's crucial and the other thing is I wanted to say that um, on May 19th um, Dr. Um, Chandan Reddy who's one of the uh, kind of foremost scholars in uh, queer of color studies is going to be doing a talk in our class um, so I'll, I'll put it out, out there for everybody but at 9 o'clock in the morning in our LGBTQ class. Um, Dr. Reddy is coming and, um, and talking about what you just talked about, but from you know, sort of an, an academic perspective. Just, so um, when you mentioned children's shows, that, that, like, that, that got me thinking because in my own experience, like with my parents, the whole idea of gender and sexuality queerness is inappropriate for children. And that's what, that's right, that's like where my family comes from. And so I, I just like, I mean obviously part of the problem is that if you think it's inappropriate for children, they're never gonna show it to children by the time kids are getting old enough to really like start to really understand these things and see the broader connections in society and have friends or themselves mm -hmm. coming out. <coughs> They don't understand it at all, and it seems weird and foreign and mm -hmm. inappropriate, like mm -hmm. forbidden. So how do we, how do we present it in an accessible way? Yeah, yeah an accessible way. And so, like, do we just accept the fact that oh, parents think it's inappropriate? There's nothing to do about that. With that, like, how do we present it in an appropriate way without changing mm -hmm. our own culture? Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, we need to change the culture. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, by that I mean but, without changing the queer culture, because there's like, uh, okay. people will look at aspects of, mm -hmm. of queerness and say that's inappropriate, but how do we make it appropriate without changing it? I think, I think, I think we are multifaceted enough of a group of people that we, there are levels of us that are appropriate and are inappropriate for children, just like everything else. And I think that, I think that talking about that diverse representation and multifaceted representation, ensuring that we do are human and that we do have layers, is incredibly important. That was my one thing, is I do agree with you that we need to do our own media and our own media, but like, as a child, I didn't feel empowered enough to do my own media, and so all I was witnessing was other people's, and so that's my one concern with using the mainstream media. And then the other layer I just want to mention because my favorite show of all time is called Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, <laughs> and in um, The Legend of Korra, that's offshoot, they did an incredible job. And though they didn't quite, they didn't quite clean it within the show, the people themselves, the creators themselves, did say that the final scene was a career representation. And I like, died a And that is a children's show. And the way they were able to do it is because they used the internet and they, because the show was like finally, sh like in its final stages were shown only on the internet, there was a different, there's a different requirements and there's a different standard set. And then I feel like the, um, but I mean, you're right though. There was another, there was Disney finally had a lesbian couple on in a show and the next season that show was canceled. And so parents clearly are, someone's complaining or someone's saying something. So you are right, there is definitely like, there's definitely like, there's definitely a hard wall to break, but I feel like that's the challenge, and that's what this conversation is about. Mm -hmm. It's about breaking those walls and about fighting the society and about not letting the master give us anything. Oh, love that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Lord, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. oh. uh, I was just gonna say I really I observe my own kids growing up, and I was a reading tutor for elementary school kids Ooh. for four years, and there was. Um, yeah, there's lots of conversations that that exact topic comes up that, you know, about an uh, administrator or another kid on the playground and knowing how to facilitate that conversation and just make it be, you know, bring humanity to that mm -hmm. person that they're talking about. And it doesn't matter 
how they identify in any way. You know, like, what does this have to do with you? Ask the kids that. Or who is this person? What do you like about this person? Or navigating the conversation to something that is relevant mm -hmm. about that person. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter, you know, if they're queer or not, because honestly, that's none of our business. You know, like, that's something, if they want to share that with us, then that's, we are privileged to, you know, share that with them. But for us to be having conversations about people's personal space is, that's what's inappropriate, not mm -hmm. how somebody identifies. And I think that um, learning how to facilitate conversations with kids because they learn how to communicate and mm -hmm. interact and talk to each other through us. Mm -hmm. And so if we allow that conversation to happen, then that's giving them the okay that this is, you know, that's the norm. And you have to respect their parents, but you can just ask them questions about, well, you know, why is, why do you think that's not okay? Like, you know, or um, that that's weird, that doesn't seem weird to me, don't you do that too? And they'll say, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the, it just gives them a different perspective. So, um, yeah, there are things that we can do and it's not, you know, starting a new sitcom, but having a tiny conversation with three little kids makes a big difference because those are going to be three adults. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, well, that's right. I think you're, it'd be good to keep in mind the history and all of this. So, I mean, like when you, when you think about Little Will and Grace, it's sort of amusing to me as someone old enough to be, you know, your, your father, that, that you would find criticisms with it. Because in context, it was revolutionary. Oh, oh. And, and <laughs> would, I, the fact that we're black characters was sort of ordinary and depressing in an ordinary way. But, but the way it presented those two gay men was astounding. Because prior to that, the only references to, 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 to gay people in, in the culture would have been Jack. So to have Will as the counterpart to say that gay men can be Will, that was astounding. Um, and, and Jack also then to be to be the comic father made Jack accessible in a way that, that people could people had a gay man in their room in their living room now, and and that was okay and, and it was and, and he would he lightened the mood, but that was because that was what it needed in that history. Um, but we live in a context that is not that history anymore, and for people like us who grew up and watched it, it is not longer in that context. And so I do agree. Well, and but that's, that's why, where it came. And so you, that's, can't, you can't judge it. No, and, so that's why, and so that's why I'm talking about the media and its empowerment because it did do that representation. Because the media does have the ability to have that representation, but it was not enough, and it is not enough anymore. And so, and so. All I'm saying is that from my personal experience in growing up and watching it, and that being the only representation, is not enough. And I am not saying well, sure that, it's not enough. And, and so I am not disempowering it, and that's why I started off by saying that it was a queer representation, and it is a form of queer representation, but it is not enough. And that's all, and that's all the purpose of the speech was to be. And, and, so, and so maybe in that context, maybe Will was the abnormal and was a different representation, but we are shot by abundance of characters that are similar to Will at this time yeah. of age. And yes, and so that's the context that I live in. And that's the context that is important to me as a person of color and as a person who doesn't identify with Will necessarily. And so that is the context in which I am speaking of. And that I can speak of. Does that, does that? That makes sense. I mean, it wasn't okay then either. Yeah. <laughs> well. It wasn't, okay. it wasn't yeah. okay then either. It wasn't representational then either. You know, it was, um, but it was, it was progress. a rep it was a I, I'm not sure. In the culture, uh, I, 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 I don't know. I wrote it. I wrote it. I wrote it. Well, for, for for what you for your topic, right? For homonormativity, it was progress because it constructed mm -hmm. homonormativity. Mm -hmm. You know, the it queer was, community have been around forever, and it wasn't. An, an, it was a it was a mainstream representation. They were like, yeah, you can have one queer character, but it's going to look like everybody else. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't progress. I would argue, and I think most people, most scholars, are arguing that very clearly. They, they really? Yes, yes. It, wasn't, that, it was a bad representation. No it started so. us into a road that we're still trying to undo. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it simplified it. It created a homonormativity that now we have to undo, mm. that we're fighting against, you know. And, it, and in that context, queer marriage is in that context, right? In that same context of like, here we are fighting for ma being mainstream. You know? some, re some representation is not always positive representation. Yeah. If I just because I, I kind of initially like it, I, I come from a place where I'm from the Bahamas and there's very limited 
representation, and it's certainly very much brought upon. Um, and so anything that kind of immediate that had a look, I was like, oh, I, I was you know, I, 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 I was like, well, I, I remember, was what? you know, so it's that perspective. It's like this is progress. Like there's some sort of something, right? But then the more and more I look at it, and the more critical of it I get, I get, I get realized, and I can relate it to my own experience. Like when I started seeing female representations mm -hmm. where I identified as a female, mm -hmm. but I'm like, but I don't quite fit. And then I, like the internal struggle that that created for me, because I'm like, okay, well, this is what gay is, right? And this is what lesbian is. And this is what this is. And that's what it does. It's doing it to the queer community, but it's but it's doing to the, the, the non-queer community and say, oh, well, this is how you are. Like, and it's not representational. So yes, like, okay, it's something in the grand scheme of things of saying, oh yeah, there's something happening, but it's in the broader mechanism mm -hmm. that we are forced to live in. Mm -hmm. Like, we are, we are all told, and this goes for, for any person of any gender, of any sexuality, we're all told, this is what you're supposed to value, this is supposed to be, oh, yeah. like, and that's from, you know, it's, it's the construction, it's like what we're told that, things are supposed to look like, and that's why there's so much value on marriage. And it's not to say criticize, I, I do want to get married one day. But I'm like thinking about where does that come from? Mm. Yeah. Why? Why do, why do I value that so much? The form of marriage or the picture of the life that I want, where does that come from? And I think that's the broader question, because there's a lot of people that don't fit into that. But it's so overwhelmingly that we're telling people that's what they're supposed to want, gay or otherwise. Well, no, that's fair enough. But no, but you have to recognize the steps. I mean, so that's where I think I don't. I mean, I don't understand how anyone could criticize that because you you have to you have to you make progress in steps. I mean, it can't to expect the sh a show in that moment to have leapt to something that was really representative. That's completely unrealistic. But I really for, think for it to move it. progress, but is it is it parts of a TV show? Guys, guys, I just want to interrupt quickly. <laughs> Thank you all. This is a wonderful conversation. Let's thank Jamil again. If you would like to continue this conversation, you're more than welcome to stay, but I would like to officially end this cozy. Officially, Kate. <laughs>